Wellington, Intelligence and the Operational Level in the Peninsular War, a case study of the Burgess Campaign, September to October 1812. A 35-minute presentation sponsored by the Defence Studies Department held at the Cunningham Lecture Theatre in the Joint Services Command Staff College, Shrivenham, on the 16th of January 2006. The speaker is Mr Hugh Davies, who is a lecturer in Defence Studies at JCSC. This presentation challenges the accepted view that the Burgess campaign was a tactical blunder and explains Wellington's use of multiple scenario planning, why the campaign failed and how Wellington then used diversionary naval activity to complete a strategically successful retreat to the Portuguese border. Please note that there are some references to the visual aids that were used during the presentation. Mr Hugh Davies. My intention with this presentation is only going to last about half an hour. It's to, first of all, outline the accepted view of the campaign of Burgos in the autumn of 1812, and then to outline what work that I've done, which sort of is a re-evaluation of that perception. So just do a brief background, first of all, um, of the Peninsula War. Context, French invade Spain in, uh, and Portugal in 1808, and pretty much take the country quite easily. However, that inspires a popular uprising amongst the people of Spain, and the French have problems controlling the territory, maintaining control of the area that they've supposedly conquered, and their resources are drawn out quite thinly, so they're not in complete control. Britain, as ever, (coughs) trying to undermine French control, is supplying arms to the Spanish insurgents, ammunition and money as well. And after doing that, they decide to intervene militarily and launch a force under the command of Arthur Wellesley to Portugal. They land in Mondego Bay in August 1808. And after several set-piece battles, the French in Portugal and General Junot surrender. And there's a convention in Sintra whereby the French are evacuated and sent back to France with all their arms and loot, uh, much to the annoyance of the British government. Wellesley's brought home and faces a court-martial, as does his two superior officers at the time. But the basis of this is that there's a new commander in the peninsula in the autumn of 1808 and the beginning of 1809. John Moore, he invades Spain briefly. Napoleon comes into the peninsula, turns Moore around and pushes him back to Corona, where Moore fights a defensive action, succeeds in evacuating the British army. Moore is killed in the process. Wellesley is, is put back in command of the army in, in 1809. They come to uh, the peninsula, to Portugal, lands in Portugal and invade Spain straight away, fight the Battle of Talavera in July 1809, but supply difficulties and difficulties in relations with the Spanish at that time mean Wellington retreats back into Portugal. In 1810, the French invade Portugal under the command of Marshal Messina, Marshal André Messina, but Wellington successfully stops Messina at the lines of Torres Vedras in the autumn of 1810 three impenetrable redoubts of forts that Wellington says that any force below 100,000 can't possibly penetrate, and he's correct. The French arrive with 70,000, and they leave in March 1811 with 50,000, not so, the 20,000 having fallen to disease and hunger rather than any sort of battle. The campaigns of 1811 stall. The British and French are pretty evenly matched, so as soon as the British make one advance, the French are able to counter that and push them back. The line is held along the Portuguese border. Portugal is liberated in 1811, but Wellington's intention of invading Spain, he can't carry that through until 1812, when the French are withdrawing troops from Spain to fight their war in Russia. So the French are consequently weakened, and Wellington is able to go on the offensive with the Anglo-Portuguese army. This leads to the Battle of Salamanca on 22nd July 1812, uh, where he comprehensively defeats Marshal Marmont and the uh, army of Portugal. That decimated army then retreats into northeastern Spain, and Wellington moves on to Madrid, liberates Madrid from the control of Napoleon's brother, Joseph Bonaparte, on the 12th of August, 1812. The big question then that I want to look at in this seminar is, what does Wellington do now? And it's a question that has stumped historians, well, for 200 years, and there is basically no understanding of why Wellington did what he did. And my intention is to try and demonstrate some sort of understanding. So, map of Spain then. We've got Wellington and Hills. Wellington and his second in command, Hill, commands his other division of troops in Madrid. We've got one French army, the Army of the South, under the command of Marshal Soult. We've got a second and third French armies in the southeastern section in Valencia, under the command of Joseph, having evacuated Madrid. 
and Marshal Suchet, who's commanded an army of Catalonia, and in the north, the decimated army of Portugal, and that's combined with the army of the north and General Caffarelli. Two important geographical features, the River Tagus and the River Ebro. The importance of those features will become pretty clear quite soon. This is what Wellington intended to do. He separated his force, sent Hill to the south, just below the Tagus, to defend Madrid from the three French armies, or present a threat to those three French armies. And he himself moved north to begin the siege of Burgos in September 1812. Burgos was a huge fortress. It was well fortified, and the French had complete control of it. There was quite a bit of mismatched intelligence. Wellington thought that they partially abandoned it and that he wouldn't have any trouble So when he got there, he'd taken with him just three antiquated pieces of artillery, which wouldn't have looked out of place in a museum, and the siege stalls pretty quickly. Marshal Soult abandons his siege of Cadiz, he's laying laying siege to Cadiz down in the south, and comes into the southeast quadrant and rendezvous with Joseph and Suchet. Simultaneously, then, the army of Portugal is reinforced by some troops from France, and they cross the River Ebro, and Wellington is forced to raise the siege of Burgos, having struggled with it for over a month. At the same time, Sewell and Joseph advance upon Madrid, and Wellington and Hill have to retreat, closely pursued by the French. The French are so strong at this point that both Wellington and Hill basically relinquish all the gains they've made in the campaign of 1812 and go straight back to the Portuguese border. Now, the accepted view is that Wellington made a massive strategic, operational and tactical blunder in laying siege to Burgos. Tactical, as I said, he didn't take enough weaponry with him. Strategic, as in what's the point in laying siege to a uh, fortress when he's clearly outnumbered, he should have consolidated his position. And there didn't seem to be any real operational plan to it. He lost the gains of 1812, which were very, very important gains, and the effect on the population at home in Britain and on the Spanish population was quite hard. Morale sank to quite a, a low depth, and the relations don't go quite so well in the autumn of 1812 after that. I counter that view. What really happened? Well, yes, the siege of Burgos was a tactical mistake. He didn't take enough weaponry with him. You can't deny that. And yes, he did lose the gains he made in 1812. However, I think he did have an operational plan. And had it succeeded, it would have been a strategic masterstroke. It would have completely secured Britain's position in central Spain and prevented the French from being a major threat, being reduced as they were because of Napoleon's ongoing war in Russia. All of this was based on intelligence, which is why it hasn't really come to light until now. The basis of my thesis was Wellington's intelligence systems in this period. So I'm going to just share with you some of the intelligence systems that were available at the time, sources of intelligence. First of all, you've got Charles Stewart, the Minister Plenipotentiary down in Lisbon. He has an extensive network of agents across Spain, most important of which are in Bayonne. They are monitoring French troops as they cross the French border into Spain and obviously as they leave Spain as well. So Wellington has a good idea of how many French troops are in Spain, and combined with operational intelligence with Wellington's own intelligence sources, he can work out how many he's facing at any one time. So they operate with Charles Stewart. Henry Wellesley, Wellington's younger brother, he's the British ambassador to Spain uh, down in Cadiz, and he has uh, agents in Madrid and in Valencia, among others. These are the two important ones I've decided to talk about and they bring quite valuable intelligence on court proceedings in Madrid, what Joseph is up to, and also what's happening on the southeastern coast. By 1812, however, Wellington has advanced so far into Spain that communication between Lisbon and Madrid isn't particularly fast. So by the time Stuart is forwarding any intelligence he's receiving from his agents to Wellington, (coughs) it's out of date. So Stuart tells his agents to communicate directly with Wellington. As I mentioned earlier, Wellington also has his own operational network of spies and agents, and they gather intelligence within a certain radius of the army and bring back news on the various French armies and what their intentions and strengths are. And it's upon this intelligence that Wellington bases his operational plan of the autumn of 1812. With all of this intelligence, integrated uh, strategic and operational intelligence, Wellington can figure out multiple scenarios Uh, what the French are planning to do. Obviously, there's no certainty about what they're going to do, so he has to make as many contingencies as possible. He knows from his intelligence, from Bayonne and from his own local networks, that the French have 73,000 men in the south, approximately 20,000 in the north, making, if they combined, 93,000 overall. Wellington only has about 70,000. 
if they combined, Wellington doesn't really stand much of a chance if they are able to combine. So he needs to form some sort of defensive barrier in order to prevent the French from, A, concentrating against him and posing a threat to his armies. He comes up with two ideas of what the French intend to do. First of all, Sultan Joseph would advance upon Madrid from the south, which is what they eventually did do. And the second one was that Sultan Joseph would fall behind the Ebro and form a strong defensive line along with the, the army of the north and of Portugal. And this was demonstrated by a quote from Wellington's staff officer in 1812, Edward Packenham. He said, Sorts at liberty either to come up in a direct line to the Tagus or by turning his force put the Ebro in his rear over which he could best retire in the event of accident. I rather imagine that they suppose the latter to be his plan from the inclination of our light corps in that direction. So Wellington believes that's Sultan Joseph's intention to fall behind the Ebro as they've done in 1809 and in 1808 and form a very strong defensive line along that river ready to make the advance in 1813 against the British again. And, in all honesty, that's the best option for the British as well. But he has to make plans for the event of both events happening. So that, to a certain extent, explains what he did in 1812. Hill was required to delay Sewell's retreat, so it wasn't just moving to the south to defend Madrid. His orders were to try and harass Sewell as much as possible, and orders to that effect were issued on the 16th of August, 1812, I said to Hill to resume the offensive against Soult if you consider yourself sufficiently strong push him as hard as you can and keep up the alarm in that quarter so the idea was that he was moving south to prevent Soult from rendezvousing with Joseph and Suchet and combining with that overwhelming force to make that overwhelming force of 73,000 on the other hand if the intention of the French was to fall behind the Ebro then Wellington himself had to form a strong line on the other side of the Ebro effectively facing off against one another with the fortress of Burgos in French hands, that would be a significant weakness. So his intention was to move north, assault the fortress of Burgos, and take it, thus forming a strong line against the French. He also ordered Hill to destroy all the bridges across the Tagus. By September 1812, Hill has retreated across the Tagus and destroyed every bridge across that river. If Hill could delay Soult from combining with the two armies in the southeastern quarter, then there was a significant possibility that when it rained in the autumn of 1812, the Tagus would flood, as it had the previous year, the year before that, the year before that, and the year before that. The Tagus was a very large river, it hasn't got many falls, it's difficult to cross, and if you're attempting to cross it in the face of a large British army, you're not going to be very successful. The river Tagus floods, as does the Ebro, and Wellington forms a strong line against the French using natural defensive barriers to maintain his position in the winter of 1812. You'll notice the large gap between the Ebro and the Tagus. It's a large mountain range, not particularly hospitable to cross in the middle of winter. So that's the plan. Unfortunately, it doesn't rain. Hills, for a start, wasn't strong enough to resist Soult, so their armies rendezvoused much quicker than expected and it didn't rain in October 1812, first time since Wellington had been in the peninsula. We're not in the days of climate change there. It's a bit of a shock that this isn't happening. It does, however, rain where Wellington is at Burgos, again holding up the siege, and the evidence of that is given by Wellington on the 12th of October when he wrote to Hill, I hope that the rain, which annoys us so much, reaches you likewise, and I should state that you will have the Tagus in such a state as I feel no apprehension in regard to the enemy's operations, be their numbers what they may. So he obviously believes that if the Tagus floods, the British army, Anglo-Portuguese army, would be safe on its shores. And that's the first time since Wellington's been in the peninsula, it doesn't flood. However, it could have been worse. Wellington, again demonstrating his operational conceptualization, Wellington organized diversionary operations on the north and southeast coast of Spain using the Royal Navy. Captain Sir Hume Popham launched an attack on the north coast at Santander, and General Sir Frederick Maitland launched another diversionary attack on the southeast coast. The point of that is these diversionary operations aren't successful tactically. They don't actually defeat anybody. In fact, Maitland never engages the French. He just walks up and down the coast a few times, and the French actually stand there and watch him do it. But the point is, the Marshal Suchet's army has had to stay behind in Catalonia, as has the army of uh, the north. Uh, they have to remain behind on the north coast to counter Popham's assault. So, rather than the 93,000 troops facing Wellington, it's been reduced somewhat by about 20,000 in all. 
Joseph decides not to pursue the retreat all the way and stops in Madrid, reoccupying the capital. And Sewell and Clausel, who's now in command of the army of Portugal, aren't strong enough to face Wellington when he reaches the Portuguese border. So, although these operations were not tactically successful, they were strategically successful as they significantly reduced the forces Wellington was facing. So the point, in conclusion then... Wellington clearly demonstrated operational understanding. He realized that if he had actions on multiple fronts, they're all designed to be for the benefit of the main Allied force to reduce French strength, maintain the divisions in the French army, prevent them from congregating against him. So in all, his operational plan had mixed success in 1812. This was backed up by his understanding of the terrain and the conditions of combat. His understanding of the conditions of combat were unparalleled. The main problem, of course, being that he didn't conduct the siege very well at Burgos. He lost 2,000 men, but arguably if he had taken Burgos without success in the south, he would have had to abandon that fortress and retreat anyway. It all depended on the entire plan being a success rather than a partial success. Hill was not strong enough to resist Sewell and therefore was unable to prevent the rendezvous. And well, not for the first time, British generals being let down by the weather. Mr. Davies was asked 15 questions. Question 1. How much do you think Wellington was influenced in going towards the Norman army because their morale component was tactically shattered? Well, yeah, I can see where you're coming from there, but that doesn't explain why he gave up pursuing them and took Madrid instead. His decision to focus on the capital is understandable because it was a strategic centre of importance for the French in the peninsula. But I rather think that by that point, if Wellington was just pursuing the army of the north and of Portugal because they'd been defeated and because their morale was low, then he should have done it earlier and would have done it earlier because he already knew that they were starting to be reinforced from France and, of course, with the undefeated army of the north, which the army of Portugal came upon. So I don't think it was just a moral component. Question two. To what extent is Wellington's operational planning in this campaign correlated with the Spanish regular armies and the Spanish guerrilla forces. When Hills goes south, there is a small army under Ballesteros around Granada, and that moves up and is designed to take on the French, but the Spanish army doesn't materialise. Ballesteros wasn't a particularly reliable Spanish commander, so he doesn't make an effort to get there. The guerrilla forces, there's not a great deal of evidence that they're supporting militarily that, in fact, that's where a lot of the intelligence is coming from, intercepted dispatches and so forth. But there's nothing to say that Wellington really relied on them. And, of course, he wasn't particularly trusting of them anyway. He didn't have a very high regard for the guerrillas. He found them quite untrustworthy. Question three. The guerrillas may not have been important militarily, but if the French had combined to deal with Wellington, they would have had to surrender the area that the guerrillas would fill. Do you think that this was part of Wellington's strategy? Uh, yeah, oh, I, I see what you mean. There's certainly uh, some expectation that the French couldn't devote every single troop to the pursuit of the British army. But in terms of the diversionary operations launched by the Navy and the various operations of the British Anglo-Portuguese army, a lot of it is focused on the need to maintain the French as divided as possible rather than relying on the guerrilla forces to distract the French totally. I mean, Popham's assault on the north coast was in combination with guerrilla forces, so they had a large part to play there. Question four. If Wellington was counting on the rivers to flood, why not send all his forces north to Burgos? For a start, obviously you need someone down there to destroy the bridges, but mainly intelligence suggested that Soult was going to reach and rendezvous with the French armies before any rain would fall, before the autumn. So Wellington needed Hill to be there to prevent that from happening so that the French armies wouldn't rendezvous before the rains came. Question five. Where did Wellington acquire his grasp of operational art? It develops slowly over the course of his career. Certainly in India, he gets a lot of ideas for deception and for trying to maintain as much weakness in the enemy as possible. But it's mainly during the early stages of the peninsula and throughout the campaigns in 1811. And to be honest, the early campaigns of 1812, he launches two sieges, the first one in the north against Theodad Rodrigo, which is the Spanish border fortress around here and the second one in the south on Badajoz. They're called the Keys to Spain. He essentially launches those sieges to take those fortresses so he can launch his offensive unhindered. He's tried to do that in 1811. Uh, that's why the campaign stalled in 1811. 
he has two sieges of Badajoz. Uh, both of them fail when the French armies are able to combine against him. So you've got the army of Portugal, it's around here in the north, combining with Sewell's army in the south to beat off Wellington's siege of Badajoz. And basically the same thing happens in the north against Theodad Rodrigo. The army of the north comes down to support Marmont to beat Wellington out of Theodad Rodrigo as well. Uh, in 1812, he launches a completely different approach. Theodad Rodrigo is a lightning strike. He does it in four days before the French can even attempt to get near him. In April 1812, he attacks Badajoz, but he realizes that the French are on to him now. That, you know, if he's taken Theodad Rodrigo, his next step is to take Badajoz. So he leaves deception operations to prevent Marmont from coming down, combining with Soult to attack Badajoz. It's very simple. He misleads the French as to his intentions, gives the intention he's staying in the north, leaves quite a considerable force in the north to make it look like his armies are still there. So it's not so much misinformation as intelligence denial, and that prevents the armies from consolidating against Wellington then. And that's really the first clear example that Wellington's got, an idea that multiple front operations are going to benefit him, and this is manifested again later in 1812. Question six. Does Wellington learn a lot of lessons from his failure? Or does he just put it down to being unlucky? There's no evidence that he specifically reflected on it and thought, this is what I should have done differently. He wasn't that sort of man. He never wrote down his thoughts anyway. By 1813, the French are much weaker. Napoleon's withdrawn a lot more forces from the peninsula. So the strategic situation is completely different. Uh, instead of keeping the French separate this time, he wants to keep, get them all together and force them into a retreat, which he does very successfully. In terms of his use of intelligence... There's some examples that he was able to learn from mistakes in 1812. For example, he keeps all of his plans completely secret. No one knows what his intentions are. Two days before the operation in 1813 began, one of his senior officers wrote home saying, we don't know what we're going to do. So he's very keen to maintain complete secrecy. Only Hill and Graham, another subordinate that he trusts, are aware of what's going to happen. But beyond that, he doesn't rely so much on terrain again in terms of the rivers or waiting for it to rain or anything. He doesn't make that sort of reliance. And I can't really find any other evidence that he, he learned much more from it. I'm sure he did, but he never got really the chance to practice it. Question 7. If Wellington had succeeded in taking the fortress at Burgos, what do you think would have happened after that? He knows that Russia isn't going particularly well for Napoleon and Napoleon is withdrawing quite a lot of forces from Spain. So his expectation, I would imagine, would be that scenario two would come true, that the French would withdraw behind the Ebro and try and hold that line. In the meantime, he's getting a lot of force from home, he's getting reinforcements from Britain, and he's made commander-in-chief of the Spanish armies in 1812 as well, so he can, although he wasn't able to use them very effectively in 1812 because they weren't obeying his commands, by 1813 he does have some control over them and is able to marshal a much greater force. So the French are weaker, he's stronger. There's a greater possibility that he will be able to cross the Ebro with some success in 1813. Question 8. Why was Wellington's intelligence on Burgess so bad? Not that I want to blame the Navy, but um, Popham is an amazing operational commander. He can execute operations very well. However, he does exercise rather poor judgment. In 1806, he launches an attack against Buenos Aires, completely by surprise. The British didn't even know about it. Uh, he doesn't tell his, his own commander. He launches an attack, takes Buenos Aires. Everyone in Britain is very happy because apparently Spanish America is open now for Britain to go and start trading. 1807 comes along, a force is sent to, to hold Buenos Aires. It's taken hostage by the populace of Buenos Aires, and the British are eventually flung out. Now, Popham, essentially, this is his fault. I mean, he did that without much strategic planning, much idea of what the, the, the reactions are. He exercises the same lack of judgment in Spain. And if you notice one of the diagrams about the intelligence agents coming across the north coast, he's able to intercept those agents when he's on the north coast of Spain. He gets their intelligence, but he's suffering from cognitive dissonance, and he only sends the intelligence to Wellington that indicates good news. And this particular intelligence indicates the French have abandoned Burgos, that they've taken all of their artillery out. Uh, Wellington gets hold of that, assumes it's going to be an easy stretch, and bounces up there and is defeated quite summarily. That's the basis of that intelligence. Question 9. 
Wellington trusted his intelligence, which turned out to be wrong. Is this because his intelligence had been reliable in the past, and as a consequence, did he change his attitude to intelligence afterwards? This isn't the first intelligence failure Wellington suffers. He has it in 1809. It's well known he's facing a large French army in his front. He thinks that a small French army is coming upon his rear. Turns out it's actually a large army of about 30,000. So it's, it's out of evidence that his intelligence failures in previously. So I don't think Wellington was a man to say, I've had an intelligence failure, I can't trust any intelligence I have. I think he was aware that intelligence was susceptible. It might be faulty and it might not be accurate. But what else could he do? He had to make some sort of action in 1812. And yes, a lot of it failed because of his bad judgment. I mean, he should have taken more guns with him when he went to Burgos. It's the only sensible thing to do. If the French have partly abandoned it, he still needs guns to make a breach in the fortress wall. So yes, there was bad judgment, and I don't think it had a knock-on effect. It didn't make him distrust further intelligence, certainly not. It's 1813, he's again relying on intelligence from civilian correspondents he's in contact with as he advances against the French through Spain. I think he's, he just takes it on the chin, essentially. Or, well, he blames everyone else, really. So that's what he did. Question 10. If Wellington had recognised the contribution made by the Spanish guerrillas to fix the southern force, do you think he would have done better to use the navy to fix the northern force? A march en masse to deal with the main force at Valencia, then defeat the rest piecemeal. It's Napoleon's strategy to find the main force and mop it up. I don't think it's Wellington's intention to actually find a big force fighting in a major battle and completely defeat it and just destroy it. I think his intention was to f literally force them to retreat, to do it without fighting as many battles as necessary. Wellington as a commander is inherently defensive is set-piece battles, Waterloo among them, is a defensive battle where he's attacked. So he's not an attacking general. That is not his favoured stance. And to actually actively pursue the French when they are, to be honest, inherently stronger because Wellington's relied on a very long supply train, first from Lisbon all the way to Madrid and then in 1813 from Santander in the north, whereas the French feed off the ground their foragers and they don't have such a supply train, not encumbered by a large train. So to actively rely on the Navy and the guerrillas to fix and then pursue the French, that's underestimating, I think, the strength of the French. Question 11. How was Wellington hoping to exploit the situation? Because by moving up to the north, he would be operating under extended lines of communication. In 1813, when he advances again into central Spain, his supply lines move from Lisbon, across to here, from Santander down to here, and that's when he's going to get shorter. So his supply lines aren't a problem in 1813. And in 1812, had he maintained that position, then it's conceivable that he would have used the north coast as his supply base, rather than relying on Lisbon still. And to not act just because you're f afraid that you're not going to be able to take on the force you're facing isn't really an option, because at some point they're going to attack you, and you have to act at least to shore up your position in order to maintain it against the French aggression in order to maintain it for the following year. Don't forget winter's just around the corner. Operations pretty much get suspended in winter. And in that area as well, mountainous region of Spain, it's not hospitable. So I don't think Wellington would have really had much threat from the French if he'd been able to succeed with that plan. It was just teetering on the brink of success, essentially. And the difference was either either massive success or, or catastrophic failure. Question 12. Could you say something about the structure of Wellington's staff, if any, to deal with intelligence? The perception is that Wellington is, the, is his own chief of intelligence and he does all of the analysis himself. That's what Ward, SGP Ward, written essentially, and what most of the writers on Wellington in this period so far I believe he did, but it's just impossible. Wellington was receiving unbelievably large amounts of intelligence. He couldn't have analysed it all himself. And he utilises his subordinates, Hill, Graham, again, crop up here, to first orchestrate intelligence operations to go and get correspondence to inform, send agents out to actively gather intelligence. And then he gets Hill and Graham to analyse it as well. They've got a specific localised knowledge. For most of the Peninsular War, the British Army is spread out quite a bit, so the 
operating in quite different areas. So they are able to analyze this intelligence, which is from their localized area, with their specific localized knowledge. They then transmit what they believe to be the accurate information to Wellington, who collates it all and uses that then to make his decision. So there's not really a, an organized staff system. He doesn't appoint intelligence officers uh, in his staff to deal with intelligence. It's an additional duty for his subordinates. And it's not just within headquarters. It's spread throughout the divisions as well. So uh, there is evidence that it's not just Wellington who's using intelligence, that he's relying on his subordinates to do it as well. Question 13. Was it a recognised duty of subordinates to do intelligence work? At the time, it wasn't some sort of job description that said you should go out and do, gather intelligence. Wellington specifically addressed most of his officers, saying, it, you know, you have to go out and find out what's going on with the French near you, and they used intelligence officers to go out and, and gather intelligence. They, they dressed in British uniforms as opposed to spies who were, who were in camouflage. He expects it of his subordinates. It was part of command in that period, because intelligence wasn't very timely at the time. Uh, in this period, because communications are so slow, it wasn't given great depth by many commanders, but Wellington clearly recognised its importance both in India and in the peninsula. Question 14. You make it sound like it was largely a matter of numbers, lines of communication and intelligence. What about the relative tactical proficiency of the two sides? The French are starting to suffer because a lot of their veterans have either been withdrawn or killed. A large number were killed at Torres Vedras. So the French are relying on raw recruits from France. Literally, in 1810, Napoleon is using the 1811 and 1812 conscription cycles. So they're younger than average and they're not particularly good. Haven't got many veterans in the theatre to train them. So the French tactical proficiency is going down. At the same time, you've got British tactical proficiency on the battlefield increasing. They've had quite a few battles. They're becoming uh, much better. They're very disciplined, not just the thin red line anymore. The French advancing in column and the British concentrate fire on that column and then charge and they're not firing until the French are within a few yards, literally. So they're a very disciplined force and the Portuguese as well, under the command of Marshal William C. Beresford, who's an amazing administrator but quite frankly a rubbish battlefield commander, but in terms of administration he, he's training the Portuguese troops up very well and turning them into a, a very capable force. Even so, the French soldier at his worst is still a pretty good soldier. Question 15. Wellington seems very proactive in the way he campaigns, but you describe him as a defensive general. Was this purely in his approach to set-piece battles, or his mentality about war? Yeah, in terms of campaigning, you can't not be aggressive if you want to take on the French. He was very reluctant to engage in a battle that wasn't on ground of his own choosing. He was a master of terrain. He understood the importance of the battlefield he was on. And if he's the attacking general on the battlefield, he's not picking the battlefield, it's the defending general. So at Talavera, at Busaco in 1810, and in the Pyrenees and at Waterloo, he lures the French into attacking him. At Salamanca, he attacked, but it wasn't his intention to attack. He realized the French had overextended themselves and, and attacked then. So quite often, the attacking battles Salamanca and Victoria in 1813. He is doing that but realising that the French are in a weak position and that he can attack it. He would never attack the French if they were on ground of their own choosing. Hugh Davis can be contacted by email at hdavis, spelt D-A-V-I-E-S, dot J-S-C-S-C, at D-A dot M-O-D, dot UK.